The unexplained Apollo 11 50th anniversary special with Howard Hughes comes to a special end. Um, we're going to talk now with an astronaut direct from the US, somebody who was, well, this is an interesting story. He was going to be part of the Apollo program, uh, but ended up being very much a part of Skylab. If you've never heard of Skylab, it was a sort of forerunner to the International Space Station, and some people say it was much more interesting in many ways. Jack Lusma is the man we're speaking with in the US. Jack, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And by the way, I was there for the entire Apollo program. I got there when the Yoni program was just finishing up. So I was uh, on the support crews for three of those flights, 9, 10, and 11, uh, 9, 10, and 13. I'm the guy who took the call on the Apollo 13 mission when they said, Houston, we got a problem. And so that's how the uh, new guys uh, got acquainted with the system, and uh, that's how we learned. We'd help the uh, flying crews get, get the ready to go, and we trained ourselves for an Apollo program um, uh, d- during those uh, lunar landings, very much involved on the ground, and um, hopefully we were going to fly in the future, but they canceled those last three flights, so it was turned into Skylab missions. So you were very nearly an Apollo man, but uh, you ended up doing something else. So if you were there from the back end of the Gemini program, which was the immediate predecessor where a lot of lessons were learned about space, what was that like? to go through that whole program, to go through that experience with people who, of course, became household names? Well, there were about 30 astronauts there uh, when I had arrived. And, uh, in fact, the original seven astronauts were still there. This was way back in 1966. And uh, so uh, those of us uh, were in the fifth group of astronauts. There were 19 of us selected in 1966, and that was about the time that Gemini 9 uh, was flying. So we were there for the uh, last four Gemini flights and uh, getting ready for Apollo. So we uh, all trained for Apollo missions, and uh, we, uh, while we were brand new, there the uh, guys who were there already were obviously going to fly first, and uh, then we were going to start flying after they uh, 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 we we joined uh, some of their flights. Some of the guys in my group uh, were able to fly on the Apollo program. And then there were a few of us uh, left over that um, didn't get to fly the last three missions because they were canceled. So we were assigned to the Skylab missions, and I uh, stayed around long enough to command the uh, third test flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1982. I didn't know this about you. This is exciting. Did you actually believe when you went into it all, when you went into the Apollo program, were you given the impression that there was a chance that you could have been one of the people to set foot on the moon first? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we were in a cadre of people that were training for all of those flights. And uh, most everybody who uh, was uh, uh, in our group uh, flew before the, or by the time the Skylab missions had gone. So we were all training uh, side by side with the people who were already there, helping them with their flights to begin with, learning in that manner, contributing to their flights. And uh, that's how we got acquainted. We were all training in the simulators, flying helicopters, and doing all the things that Apollo astronauts were going to do now the apollo astronauts from what we know of them they were all characters buzz aldrin very different from neil armstrong you were all different people you all had your own strengths when you were part of that and i think you said there were 30 people in your group how did you all get on did you feel that you were a team well there were 30 people when i got there uh, who were already there and uh, we added 19 so it made about 50 we called ourselves uh, facetiously the uh, original 19 and so we really had a group of uh, 50 people, uh, so, so to speak, when uh, I first got there. And uh, everybody was pretty much an independent person and not afraid to say what they thought and uh, always knew they were right and that the other guys needed to listen. Right. And the training itself. I think we've all seen things like the Vomit Comet, where you learned to be in zero gravity. And we've seen things like the underwater training. For you... What are your recollections and your thoughts about that time when you were going through that training, which, let's face it, for most of us would have been difficult, maybe impossible? Well, yeah, I flew uh, lots of flights on the Vomit Comet. uh, And, uh, of course, the Vomit Comet was a a 707 large uh, um, commercial-sized airplane that had no seats in it and padding on the walls. And the uh, pilots would take it up, and we would train in the back. And uh, the... uh, in the, in the cab passenger section, and the uh, pilot would fly it such that it, uh, it would climb uh, very rapidly and then push over uh, and uh, hold zero gravity for about uh, 30 seconds. And uh, by that time, of course, the airplane was diving to the ground. We all had to hit the deck and 
I uh, make a pull out and um, what well, is about two G pull out and then go through that again. So, so, so you got that. thirty seconds of what it was like to be weightless in space. When yeah, you actually like got going, into space, kinda, Jack, kind of kind of like going uh, uh, in the air through like a porpoise, up and down, up and down, <laughs> and uh, and uh, after a while, some folks didn't feel very well, so it got well, nicknamed the vomit comet. I can well understand that. Um, but when you actually got into space, was the experience like the experience you had on the plane? It was quite a lot like the experience, but you you didn't know uh, how much uh, different it might be until you actually went into space yourself. And so uh, we were then able to come back and uh, um, evaluate the kind of uh, training we got in the um, zero-gravity airplane with what the reality was. And so those of us who had a chance to fly in space, we knew what the deficiencies were. So we could uh, temper what we were learning in the zero-gravity airplane with the knowledge that we already had. And uh, we not only um, uh, trained uh, some of our procedures, but we also uh, developed some of our equipment to, so we'd know how it would work in zero gravity as opposed to, to uh, one gravity. And um, the uh, similar could be said for the water tank. We would go underwater because underwater you can be suspended in this medium. And uh, although there's a viscosity of the water in a way, you nevertheless can train for some of those zero gravity things and develop your equipment underwater. But they all also has its deficiencies. And once you've been into space, well, you know what the deficiencies are in the underwater training as well as uh, zero gravity uh, training in the um, vomit comet. So it was uh, a, a way to uh, develop our, instrument, our instrumentation, develop our uh, equipment, as well as to uh, understand the, um, the effects of, uh, of being in a weightless condition. And what did it feel like personally to be going through this thing? And you know, was it possible to live anything that we might regard as a normal life, to do ordinary things, you know, to go out with people, have fun, do other stuff? Or were you totally focused all the time on the on the task in hand? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. We are, we were regular fellows. We enjoyed our work. It was uh, usually it was uh, first of a kind. It was uh, pioneering. And we all enjoyed that, but we uh, enjoyed being with the settlers as well. We had a good family life. We had good uh, uh, relationships with each other. And uh, we were a team when we were working together and when when we had our private lives while we were just like regular folks down the street. The 11 crew, you will have known them. What are your thoughts about them? Were they people that you liked? Were they people that you got on with? Got on them very well. I did like them, and uh, I was there uh, for the whole uh, time that uh, that the uh, Apollo program was in operation. Of course, we lived about a block away from, uh, went down the street from uh, Neil Armstrong, and his neighbor was Ed White. And we lived in a subdivision in which there were a number of astronauts, and there were a few of those kinds of subdivisions around the space center, which was about 25 miles outside of Houston. So we would uh, get together, uh, you know, as neighbors as well. And I remember the night that um, the uh, Apollo 11, that uh, Neil Armstrong was getting ready to walk on the moon. His house was just bombarded with news media and uh, hmm. search sites and uh, uh, photographic lights, trucks with uh, uh, platforms on them, and uh, just a huge number of people out in uh, Jane, um, <laughs> Jane uh, Armstrong's front yard. And uh, my son was about six years old, and we went outside, and he said, Hey, Dad, I think I can see him on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like? All the accounts that I've read and the interviews that I've listened to with him suggest that Neil Armstrong, the man who did this amazing thing, that most of us can't even imagine what that felt like, but most of the accounts we have of him is that he was a very quiet man, and certainly after Apollo, of course, he became a bit of a recluse. What, what are your thoughts about What are your recollections of him? Well, I re- recall uh, Neil's being a very personable guy. Uh, he'd be out in the yard uh, raking leaves with his kids in the fall and his two boys, and uh, he'd be um, t- helping with the Boy Scout uh, operations when they had a banquet or something like that, and he lived a pretty much normal life, um, taking his kids fishing in the lake nearby and so forth. And um, when he was uh, in the office, of course, uh, he was kind of a quiet guy. And uh, But um, uh, he had a, a strong reputation. You know, he was an X-15 pilot before he got with NASA. And before that, he was a, a Navy a fighter pilot. So it wasn't as though he was a civilian totally either. And uh, he was a very personal fellow. Uh, I'd walk by the office and chat with him a little bit once in a while. And we'd have a pilot's meeting every Monday morning. 
and he'd be there, and he didn't speak very often, but when he spoke, everybody listened mm. because he had something uh, unique to say, and he's very articulate, and he uh, delved into areas that some of us uh, hadn't delved into before. So he was very uh, forthcoming when the opportunity presented himself, but he didn't impose himself on anybody either. Mm. And that fits with all the accounts that I've heard. When they picked him to be the first person to set foot on the moon, along with Aldrin, how did you feel? Did you feel let down? Did you feel disappointed? Or were you happy for them? I was happy for them. I, I knew that I was going to be at the end of a long line, and uh, the people that were there first were going to fly first, and then uh, we started getting into my group of people. So the best thing I could do was support them, to learn from them. I would read all of the post-flight reports. I'd listen to their debriefings and so forth, and that's the way we learned. And we also learned by... Uh, being part of the uh, support teams. I was, like I mentioned, uh, there, were, there were three support crew members from my group who supported uh, all of the Apollo missions. And these were guys who were not going to fly, but this is the way we learned and also contributed to the mission. And we would usually be the capsule communicators. Uh, and uh, one of my special jobs well, for the first uh, two lunar modules on Apollo 9 and Apollo 10 was to uh, take the uh, ship through the um, test and check out at the Kennedy Space Center. The uh, lunar module would come from the manufacturing Grumman, and we would have to go through a test and check out procedure. might take up to a year for the first Apollo, uh, Apollo 9 lunar module because it's brand new. And my job was to uh, represent the flight crew in um, making decisions as about the, uh, the way the uh, was getting through the test, uh, the test process. Uh, when decisions were made by the engineering team that affected me as a pilot and an operational person, and I would uh, speak up and say, it's, uh, this is the way the flight crew needs to have this decision made. And uh, we were usually uh, uh, re- rewarded with a, with a positive answer. If not, we would go to a higher level and get it all straightened out. But so my the, job the was part to make sure that the, you played in it, Jack. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the part that you played in it was a vital part, but it wasn't a part that was uh, getting the headlines. The headlines were going to the names who were going to the moon first. Um, How did that feel, to be part of the, a vital part of the support team, but not actually one of the headliners? How did that feel for you? Well, it it felt all right, because I was learning what I needed to know to finally be where they were, and I had a lot to learn. Uh, They had already learned it. And uh, this is an opportunity for me to learn. When I uh, was uh, first selected to, to go to the Skylab, I'd already had 700 hours of, uh, of uh, being in the lunar module cockpits and the lunar module simulator. So I knew that lunar module was like the uh, back of my hand, and I knew that that would come in handy, but I would not have had that experience had I not been placed where I was. So I think I was uh, placed uh, to uh, fly when my turn came, and I was willing to Grant the fact that the people who got the reform uh, had, had the more experience and were the ones that ought to fly first. And then we would be assigned to uh, those uh, those experienced ones on a one by one or two basis as time went on. And like so you I, say, I felt very comfortable. Like you say, everything that you learned as being part of Apollo, even though your missions were canceled, it was all important for what you came later to do, and that was Skylab, that was the forerunner of the International Space Station. But you're a human being, <laughs> we all are. The day that they told you that the missions that you were part of, the last missions, were not going to go ahead, they were going to be cancelled, that must have been a bit upsetting, was it? Well, it was disappointing, uh, but uh, on the other end, uh, there was nothing I could do about that except to get ready for what was ever going to be next. And so uh, I learned that uh, there was going to be a flight with the Russians, and I thought, well, maybe this will be my last chance to uh, get on board. Uh, if the Skylab doesn't work, I, I think maybe what I'll do is I will take a course in the Russian language. And so I did that on my own. I did it through the University of Maryland, and I went through the whole Russian language course. I took the exams, and then I got my diploma, and I turned it into my boss and said, look, if uh, you're ever go- there's ever going to be a Russian mission, I'm ready to go. But by that time, uh, the Skylab was already going to, it was was affirmed. It was uh, in the limbo for quite some time, but by that time, the uh, Skylab was ready to go. But I was ready to go on that as well because I knew all I needed to know about the command module. Uh, we worked for, trained for that mission after we were assigned for two and a half years. And we worked with everybody under the sun, all the experimenters, all the system managers and so forth to know how to uh, operate the Skylab. And, uh, but the training I'd gotten uh, during Apollo, that fit right in and uh, mm. added, uh, added on to when I got into Skylab. 
we were all trained to do each other's job in case there was some kind of a, a situation where the, one of our fellows... You was, had to like, work as a team. We did, and we all knew what the other guy had to do, and we could do his job if we had to. Now listen, this is going to sound like a weird question to you because you've been there, done that. But to me, I am never going to experience this. So you'll understand why I'm asking you this question. What is it like to be in space? That's a great question. That's the, the first question most people ask. It's the longest one to uh, answer. But, uh, of course, you're, when you're there, you're weightless. So your weightlessness is a very pleasant, comfortable, relaxing feeling. After we were there a short time, we didn't even think about walking. we just push off and end up where we wanted to go. And uh, imagine being able to glide to the top of your ceiling and, and uh, change a light bulb with a uh, <laughs> ladder or do flips and tumbles off the wall or even go to sleep right out in midair. It's just a, a wonderful, relaxing, pleasant feeling. And when you come back to Earth, Jack Loosma, it must be the most enormous letdown. Well, it's uh, we were ready to come home. We tried to stay longer just so we could be the longest ones, but they said, no, you've got to come home. And uh, so uh, there's a kind of a, uh, interesting joke uh, that um, goes around uh, that uh, was unique to us. Uh, w- when we went to the Skylab, all of the uh, equipment for three crews was was loaded into the Skylab space station and was fired off into space above 270 miles above the Earth with nobody in it, and, but all of the equipment for three crews that were going to go up and visit it. And uh, things were rationed to us. We uh, couldn't uh, get into the other crew's food or clothes and so forth. So every uh, two weeks, we would have a change of coveralls. But every other day, we would have a change of skivvies. That's underwear in uh, military mm-hmm. terms. At the end of the mission, we were supposed to stay for 56 days. And uh, they were going to ma- say that uh, at the end of that 56 days, that we'd run out of skivvies, of course. But um, that'd be all right. But it turned out that be- we're not going to be over the landing cr- um uh, uh, um, uh, ships in the water for four more days, and so they said uh, you got a problem uh, in that uh, you're not going to have enough skivvies. So um, uh, they said, don't worry about it. On uh, day 58, we'll come up with an answer. And so on day 58, they came up with the answer. And those are in the days of good news and bad news jokes. And that's, they said, the good news is you're going to get to change your skivvies today. The bad news is, Al, you change with Jack. Jack, you change with Owen, and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is Apollo but, humor. My last yeah, question we, for you, Jack. We love, we love being on the scale, uh, Skylab. We had 60 experiments. It's like launching a laboratory, uh, mm. scientific laboratory into space, and we had to live and uh, learn to live and, and work. And in people the, need the to remember what Skylab achieved after Apollo. My last question for you is one that you've probably been around quite a few times i think when you had to tell people what you do for a living what you did for a living and you say to them well i was or i am an astronaut what's that like what kind of reactions did you get well i usually don't tell them and uh, if they find out about that by then i I just tell them i was a very fortunate person i got to do was something that I wanted to do. Um, I didn't know when I got into it what it was going to be like, but I knew that I wanted to be part of it because it's going to be great for our country. It's going to be great for humanity. It was uh, it was pioneering all the way. It was unknown. It was a challenge. And uh, um, I, I didn't do it for the money because we just got military pay. And uh, the only reason I didn't do it for fame or power or glory, I just did it because I, I see it, saw it as a challenge, as a, a way to do something that had never been done before. It was going to be uh, tough to do, and that uh, I knew I could do it. So it was um, that kind of a way that I approached it. And when people uh, ask me about it, I just tell them this, I answer the same way that, that I do with you. They ask questions, what it's like to be there, and so forth. Some of the things, other things that uh, people like to know about is the fact that you're going around the world at 17,500 miles an hour, wow. to that, 270 miles above the earth, you're going around the world every hour and a half. And during that time, you're in the daylight for 60 minutes and the darkness uh, for 30 minutes. So you have 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. And uh, <laughs> the sky is always black in space, even in the daytime. The sky is black, but at night, uh, you look out the window and you see about five times as many stars as you can see on a tall mountain from the ground uh, on a clear night because there's no uh, atmosphere in there to uh, obliterate and those stars. Most of us can't even begin to imagine what that was like. Now, I'm being wrapped up here by my producer, but I want to ask you one very final thing. When a kid comes up to you, and presumably this has happened, and says, why did we go to the moon? What do you say? 
I say we went to the moon because we could, because we knew that it was going to be good for everybody from what we learned. We weren't smart enough to know what we weren't going to, what we didn't know. And uh, you can just see that by what happened after that. We didn't have computers uh, like we do today. There's no internet. Uh, There was a whole lot of things that we didn't have than we have now that uh, are a result of our having done that. Look at all the advancements we had in medical science because of the technology that we developed uh, while we were in space. And um, and militarily speaking, it brought the Soviet Union down because we are now able to intercept their ballistic missiles and they, they couldn't intercept ours just using the technology that we learned on the moon, everything, or by going to the moon, everything we had to do had to be faster and better and, and more reliable. And uh, so that made its way into uh, our public lives. And it certainly became lives. all of those things. Well, listen, I know, um, because we have a certain amount of effort to go through to get you on here, and I'm really grateful that you've been able to do this, that astronauts at the moment, because of this anniversary, are in massively short supply. Jack Loosma, thank you very much for telling me your story.